Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Today's video was brought to you by Predictable Revenue's Service LinkedIn Outbound. Find out how we can leverage and grow your existing LinkedIn network to book meetings into your calendar at the link below. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by Michael Tuso. He's the Director of Revenue Performance at Chili Piper. And we're going to be talking about, well, we're actually going to get super tactical into some really awesome examples of how he writes emails, how he builds his cadences and overcomes objections, replies to emails. We got lots of stuff. We're going to be very hands-on. He's going to, he's got a lot of things to, a lot of things to show and tell. So we're going to have lots of screenshots. If you check in the show notes, we'll make sure we throw those up there. This also might be a good one to, uh, to check us out on YouTube because he's going to screen share and we're going to walk through a bunch of stuff. With that being said, Michael, welcome to the show. Yeah, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Man, so we're in the middle of COVID and your team just had its best month ever. Talk to me about this magic that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> our SDR team, we, we kind of uh, evaluated our, our messaging just like everyone else um, in the middle of this. We, uh, you know, we sort of experimented um, with different types of messaging. And we actually found um, that the messaging that we were using um, historically um, worked really well um, in the context and, um, of, of everything that was going on. And what we ended up doing was really doubling down on targeting. Um, and so through targeting non-affected industries or even industries that do well in maybe a more remote structure or some other theory for reaching out to them, um, we found that we were actually able to amplify previously used messaging. So in the first week or two, I think uh, some of the SDRs on the team um, changed the messaging. I think a lot of people refer to it as uh, maybe more empathetic messaging. Um, we actually found you know, the results to actually focus on the business, business case through greater targeting of those non-affected industries to be hugely beneficial. And as a result, we had the best historical month um, for the SDR team that the company has uh, ever had. Um, also through implementing new email coaching techniques, um, our account executive team uh, and our account manager, so the whole revenue uh, client facing funnel um, did really well as a whole, uh, not, not just the sales development. And a lot of it had to do with um, the implementation of uh, coaching and training in the specific context and uh, around email specifically and what's going on um, there. And so, yeah, we we did have a surprisingly good month in, in March and followed up by a really strong um, April and uh, position to do it again um, in May as well. So uh, we, we've been very fortunate to, to see that. Very cool. I'm really excited about the framework that we're going to get to a little bit later in the episode uh, where you sort of walk through like how your team gets to the heart of what the prospect is talking about. But before we zoom in and get to that level, because we'll, we'll probably finish there, um, talk to me about uh, your, your, I, your, I don't know, philosophy on cadences and sequences and what they should look like. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing with... Um, with sequences, you know, there's a huge debate um, right now about, you know, do you personalize, uh, do you spray and pray, do you, you know, the whole, the whole sort of spectrum, you know, should each basically email be individually prescribed to that specific person, you know, or do you just put people in cadences and let the tools take care of it themselves? Um, we operate somewhere in the middle. Um, so what we try to do is to have that first a, we place a lot of emphasis on the first couple of emails. So I think that there's a lot of statistics out there about, oh, it takes 18 touches or, oh, it takes eight to 11 touches. And depending on who you ask, it changes very frequently. Um, we actually looked at it for our own organization um, and it's uh, really focused on the first two touches. Um, we, we found that that's where we get like 80% of our opportunity. And the reasoning that we figured out is because it sets up a business reason for us reaching out to them in the context of like their world, but they also know that it, it, it doesn't look like a canned email. So it's sort of in this space of like personalized, but in the direction of the business case. 
So the way that we think about it is it's contextual and relevant to that specific uh, company and business use cases, how, how we think about it. In other words, the SDRs are not reaching out saying, oh, I saw you went to XYZ University or things like that. Um, it's, a, it's about the actual business use case. Um, so whether we take a screenshot of something about their, their process and incorporate that into the messaging, um, so they know it's customized to them they can, because they can see it. So there, there, there's not, um, and, the, and the SDRs do that process super quickly kind of on, on their own. Um, so that, that's sort of how the, the cadence is run. We, we do have a five-step like email touch cadence, but like I said, 80% of them are coming from that first, uh, those first two emails. Um, and specifically in the context of kind of the world we're in right now, they're treating the, the phone for the first time more as like a warm engagement mechanism. So if someone's like opening your emails a bunch or showing some sort of interest, they'll, or, or maybe they showed interest and then kind of ghosted and you'll use the, the phone as more of a, an amplification of the email on a sort of warm method. And that has worked really well as well. I have a lot of friends in this space though, who, um, you know, claim that it's the opposite for them, that the phone is working really well and email isn't. So I think it, you really have to look at what, what's important to your company and, and test it accordingly. But that's what we found selling in sort of this B2B, you know, we sell them to marketers and, and salespeople. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of that sort of general philosophy of how we orchestrate kind of the cadences uh, to begin with and, and the success that we've had as a result. Cool. And so let's, let's dive in on that first email. Um, and maybe we can expand it afterwards to the second email because 80% of your business is coming there. But let's start with uh, what does that first email of yours look like? Yeah, so here's the first one. And um, so we just take a screenshot of the uh, web form uh, here and uh, super simple. But um, yeah, that's where uh, most of the, the results are coming from. We additionally have an ABM campaign that's a little bit more robust than this that we've deployed to be even more specific and uh, show a more before and after of what it would look like um, with the tool and without. Um, but during the, the March and April period, um, this is sort of the, the first uh, message that um, that we, we, we saw a lot of success with. Gotcha. And so just for, the, for those that are listening and don't have the screenshot in front of them, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out for you. Um, so it's from Michael. Hey, George. Hi, George. Uh, I'm reaching out because we were able to allow your qualified leads to book a meeting directly upon completion of your existing inbound forms. Leads can be qualified plus routed to the correct rep based on the on form fields and CRM data. Clients see a 60 to 80% lift in inbound lead conversion and meeting completion rates by allowing leads to book when their intent is highest in a convenient way. Would you be open to discussing how we can do this for your existing forms? And then you've got a copy paste of the, um, of the, your customer's email or web form right there. Yeah. Gotcha. So the, the personalization here is the, is that screenshot. And if you're not familiar with Chili Piper there, it's basic. it's a sim, it's like a, if you'll allow me the comparison, I hope I'm not offending anybody or at Chili Piper, but it's sort of like Calendly on steroids. Um, if you have any complex routing or if you have anything like more than just like a simple book a meeting button, there's like a ton of like complexity. At least that's what, that's what we've used it for when we deal with clients that have really complex lead routing. Uh, I find it super helpful for that kind of stuff. Uh, roughly correct, directionally correct there. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, people, we have a multitude of products now. Most people know us from uh, scheduling. Um, we also route in, um, or, or sort of flagship product is routing from your inbound uh, web form. So the speed to lead is usually pretty slow. Um, SLAs are pretty antiquated. Uh, the average SLA will be like something like 24 hours um, when Harvard is releasing studies that if you don't get back to them within the first hour, the ability to then turn that into an opportunity decreases by 88%. Um, so we do that instantaneously. That's the flagship product, but you're right. We were born out of this SDR to AE handoff. Um, I actually purchased it as a customer for that, but the product has evolved. We work in, um, events, um, and we also have, a, have tools for, um, sales rep as well. So yeah, the company has, has grown over the past couple of years. Cool. Very cool. Um, I, I didn't know that. Um, 
I, I I'd heard people talk about the lead routing piece, but I sort of assumed it was related to the the original piece. But just I thought I'd add that in for context of you're you're getting to that sort of magical moment here with the screenshot. So this is while like if I'm listening, I'm like ah, he's just taking a screenshot of the website. That sounds lazy. Um, but specifically, this is the thing that you do. This is the thing that you'd replace. Um, and you're saying, hey, if you're if I'm a marketer. Um, a 60 80% lift in conversion is huge. Like that's, I'm probably comped on that. Yeah. I think sometimes like the visual component really helps. Um, it doesn't always help if the messaging isn't good. And um, there's this thing that we call a spam filter. Just because you do a screenshot doesn't mean you're going to be able to do it well. And even if you replicated this email, it doesn't mean that your organization, it would necessarily work for you. The thing is, is that um, the whole thing has to be a coherent touch strategy that works for your company. And it, that takes a lot of experimentation. So for example, in the beginning, we had some sort of similar process where it showed a, a before and after. Um, the, the cadence is what um, you know we call activated the spam filter. So it felt like you were being sold to. And the way that we got around that when we were a tiny startup is we have these meetings once a week. I mean, I've never seen him really a meeting like this at any company I've been with. I think it's pretty unique to Chili Piper, but um, it's a meeting that's just about cadences. It's just about touch strategy. It's not accountability. It's not uh, sort of judgmental or activity based. Even it's really just like studying like what's working and what isn't, and sh and using a collective mind share of everyone um, who's involved. Everyone from our CEO is a part of it, and it's sort of like almost like a casual meeting where we're really able to up our game um, and bring a diverse set of uh, kind of experiences. I mean, one time we had an intern make one of the best like uh, contributions to how we thought about going after companies and things like that in that meeting, you know, a 19 year old intern. And then, you know, sometimes it's, it's someone who, you know, is an account executive who really cares about prospecting. So, but we, we don't just say, put your head down and, and you know, book a bunch of meetings and we don't show how, but we really create a safe space for people to have a forum to voice what would actually do it. Now, we don't have a million cadences that we run where it's like super disorganized and things like that. We're very intentional about like, it should almost be like science-based, like you change you know, one variable at a time, you iterate over a long period of time and, and you have something really solid. So I think the figuring out the messaging, uh, and the process and how you invest in that is more critical than coming up with the messaging itself because you come up with a message, everybody starts using it, it's stale. How do you reinvent yourself? Well, that comes from your process and how you did it to begin with. Cool, and I love the fact that you're getting the whole team involved in, in the creation of what, what is arguably you know, the most important part in the process, which is that first touch. Because if the first touch fails, if you're not getting any traction off those first two, it doesn't matter how good your closers are. It doesn't matter how good, uh, how efficient, you know, the, your calls are. It's just a matter of you're not getting enough volume to feed the team. And so in some ways, that first touch is the most important piece. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll stop sharing for a second so I can load up another one. Um, the very frequently, like when a VP of sales, usually like a, a more tenured one is brought into an organization, it's done so because of pipeline coverage, like the, the balancing act of how do you get this recurring revenue where you're able to sustain the number that you're hitting every month over time. And a lot of times like that's that balancing act starts with making sure that the top of the funnel um, is doing, you know, really, really well and that you're able to sustain that over time. So um, a little bias, even though I coach everyone on the team, um, but you know, if you don't have something at the top of the funnel and, and that isn't super strong, you, know, you can't even get to the issues uh, sort of mid or, or bottom to the funnel there. So yeah, we do spend a lot of time uh, to your point, uh, really being intentional about what happens there. Totally. And when we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we did our pre-interview, you had some really great examples of like um, the human element uh, of outreach. Um, and like it, uh, it sounded like that was a real focus was like teaching your reps how to be human and how to communicate as a human over email. Yeah. So um, in almost every organization um, I've worked at, our natural inclination is to 
maybe not respond to the direct specific thing that the person was saying, or that's thing number one, or we respond with just like the product as a whole, very broadly solving what they're concerned about. And it's just not the way to do it to, to be like super successful. I mean, it may, it may work for you to a certain um, extent, but what you really want to do is to pay attention to what the prospect is, is really saying and, care, and caring about. And I know that sounds simple, but 90% of the time in the, the hundreds of SDRs that I've managed over my career, the inclination is this knee jerk reaction to solve whatever they say immediately with your product. And it's a little bit too quick of a jump. So before I get into that, I want to talk about mindset for a second and how we uh, try to get them in that mindset so that they don't do that. You you don't want that knee-jerk reaction, yet you have all these sales gurus and leaders telling people, don't just pitch your product. Don't just, well, that messaging is getting stale. Uh, And and the, the reasoning is because the, the sales reps can't relate to the own messaging that they're sending out because they don't know like what it feels like. Um, so I always do sort of like a role play mock scenario where it's like, okay, whether it's a call or an email, how would you feel if you experienced this? Um, and then secondly, I constantly inundate them with every single message that I get. So I get prospected frequently. There was one time where I even openly put my email address on the internet just to kind of pulse check and see what was going on um, in the industry, but also kind of um, I wanted to see what some of the messaging was out there. I got hundreds of emails and I sent them all to my sales team, but I also was doing that regularly where I would um, send it the, the emails that I get prospecting me to the sales team. And I always go, what do you think in the Slack channel? And this really beautiful discussion will happen. Um, and what it does, it, it's so powerful because it puts them in the perspective of the buyer, plus it gets them to think critically on what they would do differently in order to make it better. And now they have that emotional component that I want. I want them to feel what it's like to be the buyer. Now, when they go back to their own emails, they're like, okay, don't do that. Don't do this. Don't just leave with the product because they, they don't have to think about it because they felt it. And so it bridges that gap automatically. And it's one of my absolute favorite tools. So then that brings me to the the framework piece a little bit more. Um, Now that I have them in the right mindset of, okay, don't do this knee-jerk reaction that everybody else is doing, um, we create a very simple framework for how we want them to uh, think about it. And the first thing is to, instead of pitching, again, just the product, you want to get to the heart of the prospect's immediate, like, uh, concern. So if someone replies back to your email cadence, say it's an email, or say it's an objection. What I'm finding is that the overwhelming majority of objections, especially through email, are smoke screens. And so the thing is that you need to do is decipher, is this a smoke screen or is this real? And so the way that we do that is through this simple framework and it's get to the heart of their concern, you wanna reframe the conversation, and then you want a compelling reason for them to uh, take whatever your CTA is and in my opinion, the CTA should not be, can we get on a 15 minute call? Like you want it to be softer than that. So, um, so the point number one is like, get to the heart of their concern. Someone says they care about conversion rates. You don't want to come back talking about speed to lead. Someone says they, you know, they need a marketing tool for X. You don't want to answer it with Y. And it sounds really simple, but very frequently that's what happens. And so you want to get exactly to what they're specifically talking about. And then that leads me to the second point, which is to then isolate that and reframe it into the conversation um, uh, from the the sort of vantage point that you want them to kind of look at it at. And then the last thing is to, and, and I'll give examples for all these so that it's concrete, but you want to provide a compelling reason for them to take whatever action it is that you want them to take. And... I usually don't like for that to be, can we get on a 15 minute call? Like soften that up a little bit and I, and I bet that you'll get a lot more um, result. Again, the purpose of this top of funnel especially is to get engagement. So that's how I think uh, about a lot of that. I just want to make sure people are listening to that. Like this is, this is amazing. The, the framework of like handling the replies, step one, get to the heart of what they're actually, what the prospect is actually talking about. So it's that tactical empathy side of things to make sure that you're not just, it's not just a smoke screen. They're not just like dismissing you. You're actually trying to get to the heart of it. Then you're reframing what they're saying 
um, in the context of, okay, this is what I think they're most, uh, what they care about most. And then you're ending with a compelling reason as to why there should be a next step, not just, Hey, I think there's a next step. Let's jump on a phone call. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have an example on that one too. Um, another strategy I really like to, to use, which um, I'll get to in a second is um, mirroring. So um, as you can tell, I'm a huge fan of never split the difference. Um, if you haven't read that book, um, there's so many, there's so many good co concepts in there from calibrated questions um, to tactical empathy, uh, to getting shooting for the no instead of the yes, that works phenomenally well through email. If you are trying to shoot for the uh, yes all the time through email, but instead you say, you know, I had a friend one time, we were at a restaurant, another sales leader, and she's like, watch this. And she went up to the waiter and said, would it be impossible if we could actually sit over there? So she got to the no and it was like, well, no. And I actually used that example with my sales team. And it, 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 you know, I think something clicked because we started doing that through email and it started uh, working very, very well. But anyway, uh, side note, but I de highly recommend that book specifically for email. I think a lot of times people think of negotiation as like a part of the call, but um, sort of read the chapters and concepts again in the context of email and it's super powerful. Um, so I I'd like to, book. if I can, if I can jump in for a second, yeah. huge, huge fan, I won't add anything, but I totally agree. The qualification, like, or their sort of, um, yeah, their negotiation side of things and some of the tactics are crazy, crazy helpful when dealing with objections, not just over the phone, but absolutely over email. I've included a link. It says, uh, it'll be like GitHub slash something, something, something slash never split the difference. Some engineer took amazing notes chapter by chapter by chapter. And I go back to that. I've read the book. And I've listened to the book and I go back to that for notes all the time. So I threw that in the, in the show notes and I'll let uh, Michael have the brains again. Yeah, absolutely. They also have a, a masterclass that's um, super great too. Um, so I thought I'd read the next email. Um, it's kind of long, so I'll, I'll kind of summarize what happened here. So uh, demo happens, they get to uh, sort of this very tail end of the process where um, they now, um, are having questions about uh, sort of terms. Um, so we don't do discounts at Chile Viper. Um, everything is super easy, straightforward, fairness across the board for everyone. Um, it's sort of a little bit of the context here. So um, the prospect says, hi, Julian, thanks for sending this through. I spoke with um, blank and unfortunately we don't feel comfortable paying an annual fee upfront um, without first validating the solution. Likewise, we don't want to be penalized for wanting a pilot first. So unfortunately, with the current pricing structure, it's a no-go for now. We'll look into alternative routes to resolve this problem. So you can kind of think about that for a second. So potentially the tool is cool, but because of the terms, AKA it requires an upfront annual payment for the year, um, they are a no-go, and it seems like a, a pretty firm sort of no-go up front uh, from this prospect. Now watch what happens here. A very brief email from our <coughs> uh, seller, and he, he says, thanks for getting back to me. I hear your position. Let me ask you one question. Apart from that budget slash payment issue, to what extent did you like the idea of using Chili Piper? So he's sort of isolating that one thing and he's going for the reframe here. Um, and then her response back, I like the product. I think we can be successful together and a good customer for you guys. But the pricing terms and your inflexibility make me pretty uncomfortable, particularly in the current climate. It's hard. It's a hard no from blank. So there's not really much I can do, even though I'd like to move forward. And then our person re replies back. It's a longer email, so I'll summarize. Um, basically says, you know, that that's sort of a shame. Like, uh, if you like the tool, that it just would come down to terms. Let me ask you another question. Don't you think that if you and Blank had known me for years, you'd be giving it a go? Because uh, despite the fact that it's not payment rules you expected, you can't deny that we're offering options that provide you with full flexibility and no risk. And then he goes on to kind of build the argument um, around that and he actually builds the credibility for himself as a person. Uh, she replies back to that email very quickly um, with, she had a meeting with a person, uh, specifically sold the 70% uh, increase in conversion rate um, to that person and they wanted a kickoff call the following week. 
Um, so that's a very specific example of how we literally taught this framework a couple of weeks before that. Uh, read tactical empathy two months before, or, or never split the difference two months before that. This is a in the middle, uh, sort of in the middle of the thick of everything I'm going on. And I think most salespeople would have gotten that first email and said, okay, and just went along with it. So I'm making it sound really easy, but I can guarantee you the average salesperson in the bottom 90th percentile would have not gotten that deal that person uh, did in, in, in that experience. So I thought that that was a, a cool example worth sharing. For sure. That's going to, that's going to be one that's going to take up a couple hours because they're going to be coming to you saying, boss, can we compromise on our pricing? Can we, can we just do a month to month deal? Can we just do uh this or that? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and he sort of like held his ground, but he did it in like a really nice way by isolating the sort of concern, reframed it, uh, and really kind of sold himself, which I thought was an interesting kind of angle to do it. Um, and I, and I thought that obviously it was very motivating to them, but um, yeah, I thought that was a cool example. I love seeing things like this, especially when you're dealing with like, this is, this could be, this is a sale that happened. There was value there. There was somebody that had a problem that we can solve. And instead of sort of like, it's the difference between, I've done a little bit of martial arts and it's sort of the difference between somebody who has never been in martial arts and somebody punches at you or like mm -hmm. somebody throws a punch, the average person is going to like lean back, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And what you're, when you train in martial arts, what you learn is like when somebody punches, is throwing a punch, the safest thing to do is actually to lean in and you get your head out of the arc of their punch because most people kind of throw this big looping arc. Mm -hmm. And so if you lean back, you're sort of in range of being hit because they can um, bring it, they can adjust. But if you lean in in a certain way, you actually, you advance yourself towards them and you set yourself up in a better position, um, but you're not, you're not backing off, right? And yeah. I, I think this is exactly what they were doing here is they're leaning into the punch. They're saying, listen, I'm, I'm here for a fight. I know what I'm doing. Uh, or maybe not for a fight, but I'm here for an, I'm going to engage with you and I'm not just going to back away and wuss out and turn around. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take this and we're going to, we're going to spar here. And they actually got the deal done. So tons of respect for that rep. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's so simple. Uh, it's so simple when executed. Well, if you haven't read the book, uh, just anybody who out there, um, persuasion um, most of the time when I bring it up they haven't if you haven't read it I highly recommend it um, same author of influence but sort of a later book um, he talks mm. about that same concept that you you bring up in, in, in part of the book there where um, you know sometimes it's better to just, uh, you know, just to download it right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's very good um, yeah, he's an he is an academic, so half half of the book is, is citations, but nonetheless a very 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 good book that I highly recommend. But um, but he talks about that specifically there. Um, with, with never split the difference though, another thing that we talked about um, a, a second ago was with mirroring. So there there's this other example I'd like to share with that, um, which was so that last an, another example you wanted to share. Yeah, with uh, with mirroring. So the I was just uh, mirroring you. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you got you got me. <laughs> um, there's a there's a, a bunch of videos of Oprah doing it online too. She's so good at that. Oh, um, awesome. I'll try and check that down. We yeah we put it on our um or we used it in our sales training one time and it was like super powerful. But um, where you just repeat the last couple of words someone says in, in the form of a question and then they elaborate. <laughs> a ton on it. It's, it's just super powerful. But uh, I've, I've never really talked about doing it through email until one of our uh, SDRs came to me and said, I don't know what to do. This prospect said, we, we have this very like coaching culture. So we're always sharing everything that we get. And the SDR comes to me and said, I don't know what to do. Prospect says they're interested in uh, more so the way I prospected her than the actual product itself. And I said, well, <laughs> craft the email you craft it, then I'll edit it when you send it, send it back to me. Um, and she said, ha ha, I don't want to demo right now, basically, but uh, how you prospected me was really cool. Can you um, tell me how you did that? So he writes the email, I make a bunch of edits to it. He's like talking about the product and stuff. And I was like, let's just make this like three lines and super simple. So because she said, ha ha, I was joking around in the beginning. Um, I, we mirrored her back and we said, literally, ha ha, I can't give away all my secrets. Just kidding. Happy to share in exchange. Could we at least show you how Chili Piper works? Um, 
and then in the next sentence, you know, we sort of tell her how to do it. Um, and she books the, the opportunity and, and looks, looks at the, the product there. So um, usually with examples like that, that are, are, are usually outside the norm, I would then like to inform, you know, the, the AE, hey, this is what happened, give them a little bit of awareness so that they know how to, the, to open the call. And very frequently, I'll have the AE make use of that white space in between their initial uh, booking of the meeting and that time in between the AE actually does that first discovery call so that it humanizes them there as well. Um, this is an example of where I definitely would have done that. So he books the meeting with her, suggests maybe times in a subsequent email after the interest has been gained. Uh, don't lead with suggesting times or your calendar and stuff like that. Wait until the interest is, is, is gathered. Then intro the AE. The AE responds uh, and sort of humanizes themselves. And it sort of makes an automatic bridge from the SDR to the AE uh, over email. So, so that's a, a quick mirroring example and how we sort of make the process really fluid. Very cool. And just so I'm clear, you're, you're not going... I just want, I'm trying to get the order of operations. Um, you said you're not going for the, like a meeting date or meeting times until there's the interest there. And that's on this, that's on the SDR side, right? It yeah, hasn't been yeah. handed off to the AE at this stage. Yeah. Um, so we did a study that, you know, if you just send a calendar link versus suggesting times, the suggesting times is 13 times more powerful uh, than just sending over your calendar link. It seems super minor, but, um, it's with the results. Um, we sort of anecdotally noticed it and decided to put some data around it. So, so that's what we found. What I'm finding now, though, is that it's off-putting to assume that someone wants to book with you uh, by including all that information up front. So what you want to really focus on is that soft CTA that I mentioned earlier. So get rid of the 15-minute ask. Get rid of you're just assuming they're going to book in your calendar. It's very off-putting, especially for like sensitive B2B marketers and sales salespeople, uh, maybe not quite as much, but especially on the marketing side, just what we prospect into. Go for the softer ask, get the interest, and then you know, then use the power of the tool, suggest your times, and you, boom, you have the instant meeting. So that's what I definitely uh, recommend in, in this our our SDRs do too. Cool. Can you give me an example of what the like the softer ask before going for the times would look like? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, it, it, even if it's something as simple as like, um, you know, is there any interest in, in, you know, exploring this further? Like something as simple um, uh, as that uh, is something that, you know, we, we've seen well. Um, we, don't, we don't do them canned. So um, usually each one, it goes back to kind of thinking in frameworks um, as opposed to dictating exactly what they say prescriptively. Um, so the ask could change depending on who you're talking to so if a person says uh, uh, usually they'll say something along those lines though like is it is this worth it to explore this you know further with you um, or another one we use in COVID is under the mutual understanding of learning um, you know I'd like to to introduce you to you know someone on our team um, it is another way to do that. That worked really well too during um, the, especially the beginning of this when everyone is sort of there a lot more uncertainty in the beginning I found. Um, and so we kind of use that mutual learning CTA and that worked well um, it, for, for people. So um, we try to be adaptable there, but the general theme is a softer ask. Gotcha. Two comments there. One, um, we are on the, was it 20 something, 22nd of May? Um, you said in the beginning, people were a lot more sort of sensitive. Are you finding that people have sort of re returned, rebounded a little bit? That's a good question. So um, there are definitely, so I've seen numerous data points that there's definitely companies doing business right now. For us, it goes back to um, targeting by industry. I, in my experience, it seems like, um, stalled a tiny bit, then picked back up for us because of our targeting of non-affected industries. Um, sort of that continued in April, which is my read on the, the situation. Um, a little bit of a, a lull in the beginning of May for us, and it seems that business is picking back up. 
Um, I think for, so we work remotely. I think part of it is where multiple variables being introduced at once um, to people. You're working remotely. There's this thing going on in the world. Like you're trying to cut costs. Like there's so many different things going on. So for us internally, um, we we're already remote. So we just kind of focus on what are we going to do? I think other companies were like, adjusting to remote and now have since adjusted to remote so i think that's part of it um yeah i think that's part of it totally fair yeah i mean i i I, what you described sort of lines up with my experience is we went through that initial like hey there's this thing is actually real um then how is this impacting our business you know you you deal with the sort of customer impact you sort of make the financial changes and adjustments and now it seems like i wouldn't say we're on the other side but we we went remote we've made those adjustments we are it's starting to feel like we're returning to normal a, a little bit so i, I think that kind of lines up um we're seeing that in our pipeline as well um which is a good sign um to bring it back to the to the original uh conversation it sounds this reminds me of like a sandler trial close right where you're not asking for the business but you're saying hey if i could show you x value is that interesting to you um and it's certainly a softer version because the sandler one would be would be saying something like if i can show you how i can increase your meetings by 60 80 percent would you buy from me or like could you see any reason why we wouldn't do business together this is like a softer version of that because you like you can't pull something. I think it'd be harder. I suspect it'd be harder to pull something like that off over email um, yeah. than it would be in person. So I think it, that really depends on who you're selling to. <clears throat> so when I sold to, uh, I've sold to accountants, manufacturers, lawyers, salespeople, HR people, um, and <clears throat> how I talk to them is is really different. Even though a lot of people say you know every sale is the same, I I have found my experience to be very different. Now, the, the, the Sandler sort of sale um, in, in that specific regard has worked well, in my experience, from B to B to C companies, um, whereas we sell B to B to B. In other words, our prospects also sell to other businesses. Mm-hmm. And I sort of have found um, that this soft ask is, uh, so uh, to, to be precise, I brought that into Chili Piper in the beginning and it ended up being a mistake because it was too hard of an ask, but it has worked for me and other companies. And I know other people who are doing it successfully right now. And I think it, I think the messaging depends on your audience for our audience, the softer CTA, like if someone said, if I said that to someone that I uh, have trained in the past, they would say, Oh, you just trial closed me. Like there's a label for that. Um, there's not really a label for reframing the conversation and having a compelling reason for your ask because it's a framework and it allows you to have a more dynamic conversation with someone. So that's kind of the way I've really evolved over the years and and how my thinking has progressed, but that's kind of the way I think about it. Very cool. Anecdotally, um, we've done some testing ourselves. We've got some outbound labs video where we actually did some specific split testing around um, going for over like over a cold email going or cold email chain going for the uh, a direct close versus going for a softer softer ask and uh, and the softer ask won by a fairly significant margin yeah that's awesome um i had another uh i had another sort of uh pattern break one uh if we have time yeah let's get to it <clears throat> um okay so this one uh says uh actually i can probably share my screen on this one if that's cool. Yeah, love to. All right, so I just brought up the two screenshots here. You can see this. So he says, um, hey, uh, congratulations of being the one of probably 200 emails I've gotten post our fundraising, basically. We all know those emails, like you get funded, a bunch of funding, and everyone thinks you all of a sudden have money, and they prospect you. So uh, our SDR <laughs> basically says, wow, I feel so honored. Not 50 million in the bank, honored, but still extremely honored, LOL. The LOL mirrors the LOL and the person's um, initial email as well. Um, and then he said, you know, it's great that we're connected. Um, he answers the question that the person has as well. So it's just another like small, seemingly small thing, but like this person is like not thinking, oh, this is like another SDR at another company. And then his message back really reinforces that he's like a human being, like, talking just like you and I are right now. Um, 
but I don't want to just like say like, let's be more human. I think there's enough like vague re- rhetoric out there specifically. The thing that he's doing to be more human is first he starts with the disruptive message that I showed at the beginning that gets the response. Now he really reinforces that to, through kind of making a joke through an email um, and then mirroring him as well. So it's not just being human. It's hard to have actionable insight into that, but it's like, what are the things are, that he's specifically doing to be successful? and then he pivots into talking about what the prospect specifically asked and cared about. So I think uh, our one of our SDRs, Tyler, does a really excellent job of this. Yeah, it it looks like a real conversation, not just some not just somebody picking the the right template. I mean, like, okay, let's let's do it. You're yeah, <laughs> you're you're mirroring, you're matching the style, lowercase LOL. Um, they they didn't even include a period there. Um, Interesting. Um, what, just out of curiosity, what was the first email? Did we did we cover that one? So is this a continuation, or was that the um, one you just? Yeah, it was the one that I shared at the the beginning. So okay, uh, cool. he just responded to that. Yeah. Gotcha. 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 Nice. Um, love how they're. Yeah, I love how you're. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid saying making it human, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard not to say that, but I. Uh, yeah, it, but but it, it shows how you do that and not just say, oh, go do this. That's, that's like another another thing just in the space in general. I think so many SDRs <clears throat> are told go do, but they're not told go, this is how, this is how you do. And I think one of the things that I've seen SDRs struggle with is, um, especially when you have targets and like, I've been, a, I've been a new sales rep. I know, I know what it's like. I've felt the pressure of carrying a bag, especially one that, you know, in many, some organizations, they're unrealistic um, where, you know, 40% of people are on quota um, or less. I've been in organizations where 10% of people are on quota and it's like, okay, well, who really expects? Yeah. And so the, the, there's a ton of pressure when you carry a bag that's so unrealistic. It forces you into some bad habits. And one of those bad habits is I'm just trying to get as many things done as quickly as I possibly can. All right. And I think so much of sales comes down to how do I choose to spend my time and attention? Right. And I think this is a really great example of an SDR choosing to spend their time and attention in a very thoughtful way at the, at the very beginning of this email, because they recognize that this is possibly one of the highest value activities in their entire day. Mm-hmm. And it seems like such a small thing. You might think like your cold calling block um, is is your most entire is your most important, you know, hour and a half, and, and possibly. But we're talking about it. Probably took him three minutes to to read and reply to that email. Five minutes, you know, that's probably the best ROI on the re- return on time that you're going to get is is an investment at the beginning of this email to make sure that it sort of it matches up. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the we have been very fortunate with our SDR and our sales team in general really being a part of this sort of sharing type mindset. And uh, and and then off of that, we've tried to do a good job of instilling a culture of autonomy. So uh, I don't think that this uh, same type of uh, sh- structure like I would have been able to create maybe in, in previous roles. Um, and I think there's a couple of factors because of that. I think one, I do attribute a lot of this success to remote because they have greater access to talent. It's a not as strict of a work environment. Uh, one time I was, someone was asking me uh, um, about remote work and he said, um, well, how do you know how long the, the lunches are of the people on your team? And my response is like, if you know, a, stop micromanaging your team, and B, um, you know, if you if you don't trust your team to work remotely, you should have never hired them to begin with. Period. Um, and so it starts with uh, trust and autonomy um, of your people, and then it, you know, people. I I rarely meet people that don't want a badge of honor. That uh, someone who doesn't want to do a good job without something being sort of wrong or the role just not being a fit in and of itself. Like if the role is the right fit, you're going to want that badge of honor and you're going to intrinsically want to do a good job. And that's irrespective of pay. That's irrespective of spiffs. That's irrespective of all these external things that we're always shooting for. And when you create this environment of like, okay, you do you, I'm going to give you the training and support and infrastructure that you'd need. And when you need me, let me know. Uh, 
you know, I think um, very frequently, even despite the environment that we're in, I still see messaging like, I'm trying to control what they're doing. And it's like, don't control them, enable them to be, you know, the best type, uh, enable their performance to be optimal. And sometimes that is holding them accountable, but it's not telling them, oh, go do more calls and emails. It's really getting granular about what it is you're specifically asking. And then, you know, I, I don't ask them how many calls and emails they're doing. I trust that they'll do a good job. And they do. I mean, that's why they're exceeding their numbers right now. <laughs> Totally. And I think that's one of the, one of the benefits of being on a, on a sales team or on a, a comp, you know, in a team where your metrics and the performance is very visible and that's, it's really the only thing that, that matters. Um, anecdotally, we had a bit of a culture like that. I can't say it was perfect, um, but we took 55 people remote um, in a, in a one week period. We said, okay, like wow. we, we gave them notice on Monday or on Wednesday saying next week, this was like beginning of March. I think it was like first week of March, second week of March. We were pretty yeah. early. Wow. Said like uh, starting Monday, everybody's working remotely. Cool. And the only problem relating to uh, people's working hours that we've had to address is people actually working more. And <laughs> exactly. <themselves> out, <laughs> which is the exact opposite of what I thought. I was like, they're at home with their PlayStations. They're just going to sit and play computer games and watch YouTube and this and this and that. And we've actually had to have some com serious conversations about setting boundaries. Yeah. Um, I, I'm guilty of it as well. I yeah. suddenly don't have a commute anymore. So I'm not exercising as much because I used yeah. to use my commute to run or cycle or whatnot and yeah. find my my day just expanded two hours. So it was the exact opposite of what I sort of feared would happen. I didn't fear that it would happen, but I think in general, in the past when I was thinking about a remote work culture, I had those same thoughts, concerns. How do we know people are doing their jobs? And, and it's not really a legitimate concern because how do you know people are doing their jobs and they work in an office? It's like, you can't see them yeah. like actually producing. You can see them typing. You can yeah. see them sitting there, but that's not really what's creating the value. Exactly. And it, it, it's like the how part. And I think that um, people figured out the, the what part a long time ago, and they're like holding on to that. Now it's coming down to execution, messaging, targeting. It's becoming almost like more science-based and less like gut check. Like, and so I think that those leaders who are struggling and, you know, write me messages on, on, on LinkedIn that are still kind of really far behind or are the ones that are still kind of managing to that what. I mean, I definitely can relate to that too with with um, the, the work-life balance thing and have always worked uh, in an office until, until this company. But if you think about it, we give college students more autonomy than we do grown adults. I mean, if you really think about it, like, <laughs> you know, is your teacher sitting there watching you write your paper after she, you know, he or she assigns it? Like, no. Um, I started, I was, I am naturally gravitate to working too much and uh, I always have since I was younger. Um, so one of the things that I've done to kind of be proactive about not doing that is I bookend my days with walks, um, listening to an ebook. And when I leave the house and listen to my ebook for like 45 minutes, it, you know, come back home, I learned something, got some exercise um, and when I'm back home, I'm at work and then I leave again at the end of the day, go on a 45 minute walk. I read an or I listen to an, an hour and a half of a book per day. When I come back home, I'm out, I'm at home. And, and now I kind of act like I'm at home again. And it, it's been super effective for me to stay focused um, and not and mitigate distraction, but also so that I could be productive at that time, but also not let work spill over to when I'm like having like family dinner and stuff like that or trying to do laundry or something so um that's the way like i've structured it i think um i've heard a lot of really cool examples but that seems to be the one that works best for me very cool i love that um and i because i think one of the the easiest i think the one of the ways that we slip into this working too much is that we don't have that oh i have to be at the office by a certain point and so you just sort of you get up when you used to get up or at least i do and then it's like, okay, I've got through my morning routine. We've got the boys sort of dealt with. Mm -hmm. And now I would normally be commuting, but now I'm just like, okay, I'm on my computer. Yeah. And so there's, there's none of that. Like, I love how you've got, you know, at a certain period of time, you just walk out and you can hear the two little monsters probably on the other side of the, of my mic here. Yeah, exactly. Like we're all in the same boat right now. So I think, um, yeah, we're, we're all in the same boat.
Cool. I got, I got one last question and we'll get to yeah. the, the sort of cold calling. Cause when we were talking, you had a really interesting thing that you did with your, with your cadence tool. You actually pulled data out of oh, your yeah. cadence tool. So talk to me about what, what you're doing and why. Yeah, so um, our RevOps person is uh, the best I've ever worked with. Um, and he is just like super good with tools, uh, super good with technology. Um, he, he did like SOC, I think it was SOC 1 and 2, which is a very complicated security review. And like, I think I want to say like three weeks, like su something super crazy left. Uh, uh, when we were one of our clients needed it so he's like super super smart really good at this stuff so what he does is he sort of runs through the uh, metrics um, usually in conjunction with our SDR manager who is a former SDR here um, and it's uh, I think there's sort of a little bit of lag time going, uh, with some of the tools um, instead of thinking the way I think about it is that I, I think of what do I need and then I find the technology to, to meet it. I think what we're experiencing because there's so many tools out there and we're having decision paralysis and just so much inundation right now is we're saying, oh, let me go search for the technology and then match it to what I need. And I, I really think you need to think the other way around. So um, we tried doing that, but we, could, we don't really find some things that is robust enough um, in our in our experience um, to find exactly what we need and maybe there's tools out there and maybe there's people out there that will educate me um, but, but we try to be more analytical about the micro stages along the funnel examples are like how many people does it take to reach out to within an account over what period of time in order to convert an opportunity um, and what's that uh, and what's that ratio um, how many uh, what's your activity to accounts look like? Um, not don't just look at replies, but look at positive replies. How much of your SDR revenue, or how much of your revenue is contributed from SDRs or inbound? And really know those numbers. Um, don't just look at meetings attended. Don't just look. Definitely don't just look at meetings. Um, it's okay to have a progressive structure where maybe you compensate people on one thing. Um, and then kind of grow over time. But I think really aligning towards revenue and looking at all the micro components that lead up to that is absolutely critical. Um, I don't think that teams analyzing these numbers um, are, are doing a, a good enough job of that. And I, I would put myself in there as well. I think we all have a, a lot of room to grow in terms of like, what are the specific things that are contributing to our success? Um, and you know, a lot of it is the coaching and the email coaching that I'm talking about too, but there's an analytical component that I think we can all level up on as well. Very cool. Yeah, I, um, I tend to agree. Uh, we've had this conversation before and we actually, I might introduce you to, to one of our guys. Um, we've got somebody on our side that's an, an engineer that's pulling information out of outreach and throwing it into like, um, uh, not a big spreadsheet, like a Google data manager or something like that so that we can actually collect and reroute yeah. the metrics in a way that we want to. Yeah. We used to use, um, I think in the last company we used like a Google connector and we, we called it one of them. We had an inbound analyzer and an outbound analyzer and it's this huge spreadsheet of uh, metrics, but it really provided a ton of insight, even like, uh, which AEs are better at closing inbound and outbound. Like, mm -hmm thinking like super, super granularly about the things um, that are going on and use that to inform overall kind of um, intelligence um, about what, what's going on. And um, we talk about it a lot here too, um, but it's, it's trying to figure out causal relationships between things that are happening on the sales floor and not just winging it. Totally. <clears throat> if people are curious, I believe the tool, uh, the tool that I've used in the past is called, is a Google uh, Google Sheets extension or add-on called G Connect for Salesforce. Mm -hmm. It's like G dash G Connect Salesforce. You, you search for G Connect and Salesforce yeah. in the Google Sheets add, and you'll find it. Um, but yeah, we got our guy. We're we're looking at that. We also have our, our guy Jerry pulling directly at outreach. Um, but anyway, I've I've digressed. Um, so the what are the specific metrics that you're pulling out and uh, that you you get from pulling things out of uh, Sales Life that you can't get? Um, so some of the things we, um, so I, uh, I mentioned like positive reply rates is like a big one. Um, 
how many people on average per account does it take um, to, to close a deal? Um, what are the actual touches? So like I just mentioned earlier, like everyone shares these really broad metrics. Sometimes I have questions like anytime I see a study, especially now where a bunch of data is released, I immediately go to methodology um, because that's like, there's so much information out there. You have to gravitate to like, okay, how is this conducted? Um, so, you know, touch point for your own specific company. Like uh, I haven't seen that happen. Um, uh, other than just like people broadly saying, this is what the industry is doing. Well, you have to think a lot more granular than that to like how it specifically applies to your personas, your product, your uh, customers and things like that. And this whole like broad strokes approach doesn't um, really work as much. Um, so really just thinking beyond activity metrics alone and like opportunities and revenue and like, what are all those things in between? One of the biggest ones I mentioned um, is, you know, sort of we're big fans of uh, positive replies number, uh, you know, people talk a lot about uh, people buying and selling and, tribes right now so like how many people per account does it take to reach out to to get a demo how many people are involved in the decision making process like what do those metrics look like so those are just a, a couple um, on the on the spreadsheet that, that we, we've created perfect um super valuable i love that you're uh, that you're not sort of beholden to one tool and that you're sort of a process and data first like what is the problem that I want to solve first and then let's figure out what tool and sometimes that's going to be your cadence tool sometimes it's going to be your CRM sometimes it's going to be um, but the, I totally agree with you the whole tool first approach is is a little bit bonkers I understand how we get there because we're there's so we're in like a tool abundance world right now and yeah um, it's so easy to just gravitate to a like hey I got a problem okay I think I could solve it this way I think there's a probably a piece of software it's such an easy way mm -hmm. um, we do that for so many things I just did the other day for a slack app I was like, oh, I bet you there's a Slack app for this. And no thought to process whatsoever. Um, I yeah, love, I, the frame, love the framework, sort of like getting to the heart, um, the tactical and empathy, reframing the conversation um, and ending with that compelling reason that is not a trial close. It's a very soft version or a, uh, a near relative of the trial close um, over email. Um, super valuable. Really appreciate having you on the show. I want to give you a chance to sort of promote Chili Piper or whatever it is. So let's do uh, our cold call role play here. Sure, absolutely. So with that said, so talk to me about the persona that you're typically calling into. Who am I? What type of company do I work for? Yeah, so um, we sell into uh, SaaS companies, um, usually someone in a marketing or marketing ops type uh, role, um, looking to increase their conversion rates and speed the lead at the top of the funnel. Um, and usually that's uh, usually we do that through the inbound uh uh, web form. Cool. Okay. I'll do the ring ring and you'll do the, the cold call ring ring. Hey, this is Colin. Hey Colin. This is Mike with Chili Piper. Do you have a quick minute? I got a minute. I'm just heading into a meeting. Oh, absolutely. Me too. <laughs> um, yeah, I just reached out. Um, you know, saw you're the director of marketing over, uh, at zoom. Uh, we basically, uh, qualify your meetings directly through uh, your web form, uh, seeing uh, about 70% uh, increase in conversion rates right now. Um, you know, notice you posted something about that recently um, on, on your form. Do you, do you have a couple of minutes to, to chat? Yeah, we have thousands of sales reps here. <laughs> and, uh, and lead routing is a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. I can only imagine right now, especially with uh, everything going on in the world. And, you know, I had a friend, um, you know, at Zoom told me she's working like 12 hours a day. So it must be a, a lot going on. Um, totally, totally get that. Uh, how, do you, how do you all do that currently? I live at the office and sleep here. I have a cot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we just have our, our forms. They go into Salesforce and, uh, and Marketo and there's the routing. We use the, uh, the, what are they called? The things in Marketo that do the routing leads. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, um, I'd love to just set up a quick call for you to take a look at the tool. Um, it'll help you get that over to your, your SDRs, qualify them a bit faster. Also, you know, you can take that qualification into account, um, and, and, and route it appropriately to the correct, uh, person as needed. Um, as I mentioned, we're seeing about 70, uh, sometimes even up to 80% increase because it happens that that routing process ha happens instantaneously. Um, do you have some time later this week to take a look? 
That sounds great. You got it, Michael. Cool. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, this was great. Um, the, um, if people want to get in touch with you and talk about the framework, talk about, you know, buying chili piper, or, um, or, um, I always, I always want to call it chili pepper. And mm -hmm. I, I, I said chili piper and I paused. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to talk about chili piper, if they want to talk about your framework, if they want to just reach out, connect with you, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Yeah, absolutely. I'm super active on LinkedIn. Um, it's the fastest way to, uh, to get a response from me. So uh, yeah, absolutely. That's the fastest uh, way to, to get a, a reply from me. Perfect. I'm going to throw a link to Michael's LinkedIn in the, uh, in the show notes here. Uh, so check him out there. And thanks, Michael, for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Right on. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you all next week. All right. Shout out to Predictable Revenues, Service LinkedIn Outbound, service for sponsoring this video. As a founder and sales leader myself, I, I know most of the best practices in terms of like what I need to be doing on LinkedIn, um, but sometimes I just don't have the time. Um, you know what the right things to do are, but it just it comes down to a trade-off of what's what's a better, where, where's my time better spent? Um, and can I find somebody to do, to click around on LinkedIn for me and book meetings, you know, and then I can focus on higher level activities. Um, and so think about it. What's the best use of your time? If you're a founder, sales leader, and you have a team, you need some meetings, I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, I'm using it myself. I'm obviously the founder, so eating our own dog food. Um, but if you're curious, click the link below to learn more. Thank you.